Good evening, everyone. I uh, will give everyone a second here to join, but we are so excited for our awesome event tonight. We have been looking forward to this for months, ever since we knew that we were going to have the opportunity to host um, this amazing author and conversation partner. So, um, Thank you so much for joining. We are The Novel Neighbor. If you're not familiar with us, we are an independently owned and operated bookstore found in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and we are hosting Nancy Jo Sales tonight and Marissa Meltzer. So for, sorry, I forgot to tell you, for the book, Nothing Personal. My Secret Life in the Dating App Inferno by Nancy Jo Sales. So before we hop into conversation, I wanna tell you a little bit about these incredible women who are joining us tonight. Marissa is a New York-based writer whose latest book, This Is Big, is out now. It's part biography of Jean Nidich, who founded Weight Watchers, and part memoir about her trying to reckon with a lifetime of dieting. She also writes the Me Time column for the New York Times style section, which is about first-person fitness, beauty, wellness experiences, and has contributed to The New Yorker, The Guardian, Vanity Fair, New York Magazine, and Vogue, among many, many other places. She grew up in Northern California and the kind of family that shopped for organic produce and drank fresh squeezed juices and green smoothies decades before that was considered chic. In fact, she dreamt of living in the kind of home that kept kudos bars on hand. Maybe because of that, she has always been drawn to the promises of self-improvement and also the way it seems impossible. She is often the one at the new moon ritual and yoga Lottie's class or laughing meditation that wishes she was having a life-changing experience. Her goal is to be more like her bulldog, Joan, who sleeps 22 hours a day. Who can't relate to that? And our star this evening, Nancy Jo Sales, whose book is out today, again, nothing personal, My Secret Life in the Dating App Inferno, is a New York Times bestselling author and award-winning journalist who has written for Vanity Fair and many other publications. She is known for her stories on youth culture, celebrity culture, and social media. She is also a filmmaker. Her HBO documentary, Swiped, Hooking Up in the Digital Age, came out in 2018 is, and is an investigation into how technology has changed the landscape of sex and dating. Her book, American Girls, Social Media and the Secret Lives of Teenagers, explores how social media has transformed the lives of girls and young women and presented them with unprecedented challenges, especially the scourge of online sexism. Her book, The Bling Ring, How a Gang of Fame-Obsessed Teens Ripped Off Hollywood and Shocked the World, tells the true story behind the Sofia Coppola film, The Bling Ring, which was based on Nancy Joe's variety fair piece, The Suspects Wore Louis Vuittons. She is born, was born in West Palm Beach, Florida, and attended the Phillips Executor Academy, graduating as a presidential scholar. She was a summa cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Yale, which awarded her its Willits Prize for fiction writing. She received her MFA in writing from Columbia University in 1991. Her awards include a 2010 Mirror Award for Best Profile, Digital Media, a 2011 Front Page Award for Best Magazine Feature, and a 2015 Silurian Award for Magazine Feature Writing. And like I said, we are here tonight to celebrate her book birthday of nothing personal, which is a truly incredible memoir. We were captivated by it from the moment that we read an advanced copy, and we are just so excited. So without any further ado, I will bring on our wonderful guests. Hi. 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 I'll turn it over to you two. Hi. 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 Oh, Hi. so happy to be here. I'm well, sorry, you know, that that actually is kind of my first question. I, I don't want it to sound too banal, but I the book begins sort of with a quarantine moment, you catching up with friends mid pandemic. And so I'm just wondering, like, check in, like, how is your how is your quarantine? Where are you now? Where is your headspace? Who are you dating? <laughs> Etc. Um, well, I I'm going to answer all of those questions. But first, I want to say how happy I am to see you and finally meet you. Oh, we have friends in common. I've heard so much about you. I love your writing. I love this is big. You're such a wonderful writer, Vanity Fair writer too, like me. And I'm just so happy to finally be able to talk to you because everybody always tells me how wonderful you are. And we are supposed to meet in person soon because you've moved to my neighborhood, which is the Lower East Side True. of Manhattan. And um, I can't wait to see you maybe even tomorrow morning at my book giveaway. 
<laughs> I, you know, anytime there's bread involved, there's she's giving I'm away giving, books tomorrow I'm, with baguettes. I'm out baguettes and bread. See, I can't be in person with people and like talk to them and hear about their dating stories and press the flesh. Can't do all that. So I'm just going to go to my local cafe and give away books. And um, the other thing I wanted to do before we started was I just want to give a shout out to St. Louis, Missouri, which is very near and dear to my heart. The Novel Neighbor, which is hosting us tonight, is in St. Louis, Missouri. And this book is dedicated to a man from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, my friend. And his dad has like this huge newspaper in, in St. Louis called the St. Louis American. His dad's name is Donald Suggs. He's the publisher, senior. Okay. And my friend was Donald Suggs Jr. And he sadly passed away in 2012. And, um, but he still makes appearances in the book because he talks to me like from the beyond. It says, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? And uh, yeah, because he, I feel like he's watching over me. So St. Louis. Happy to be here. So your question was, mm -hmm. um, I'm sitting on a very uncomfortable, like, <laughs> counter bar stool, because this is the best place. I'm also sitting on a counter bar stool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was an SNL skit recently about how every party is just people doing, like, awkward quarantine catch-ups, which is sadly true. Um, but I do think because your book has this glimpse of life in the beginning of the pandemic, you could just sort of tell us, ease us in, how did it go? Well, my book was done, finished, like handed it in right mm -hmm. when the pandemic struck. Okay. And it was supposed to come out um, like half a year ago, but it got delayed, delayed, delayed because I looked at everything that was happening and I knew that this whole situation was going to change dating so much more even, I, I, I just saw immediately, because I've been thinking about it and writing about it, online dating, it's a memoir, nothing personal, it's a memoir, but it's also, it's what they call an investigative memoir. I sort of reached yeah. into- Reported memoir, yeah. Right, online dating and what's happening with that. And suddenly everything in online dating was gonna change because there wasn't going to be any kind of dating except for online dating. Because mm -hmm. everyone was in quarantine and in lockdown. And that was already becoming true. One of the things that people I interview about online dating and I also bemoan is the way that it's kind of overwhelmed dating to the point where people feel my people that I interview tell me there's no way to date anymore. This is it. Like this is what you have to do. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that. I think that have to do with um, uh, the way that tech rewires our brain and causes addictions okay. and all this kind of stuff. But um this was going to change it even more. So I said to my editor, I have to rewrite this book. <laughs> I'm sure that's exactly what he wanted to hear or she. Yeah. <laughs> she was very understanding and she agreed with me because we both kind of, we've been talking about all of this for at this point, you know, I did it pretty quickly, like a year and a half. Uh, we've been talking about this and yeah, I mean, of course. So, I didn't like completely, completely rewrite it, but I did kind of rewrite it in the sense that I reframed it. You know, the opening scene is a scene where I'm talking to a friend of mine in quarantine and, and she's telling me about going on dates in quarantine. And she's, there's many women of many different ages interviewed in the book, but this particular woman who opens the book is a friend of mine who's about 60. Because okay. everybody, online dates now. When I first started, it was all 20 somethings and 30 somethings. But now it's like, I mean, you have people in retirement communities online dating and, mm -hmm. you know, everybody. So she's about 60 and she was just sort of wandering into the, into the wilderness of online dating right when pandemic struck. And I just watched her going off like, a, like a little lamb into the woods. And I was like, oh. <laughs> but I, but I supported her in what she was doing. Cause you, you, you have to find out these things for yourself, you know, but I, yeah. I asked her the questions that I knew she needed to think about that, I, that I might protect her a little bit. Mm -hmm. And she managed, and she's like a character throughout the book as there are other characters of different ages. So what was I doing in pandemic? 
In quarantine, I was mostly rewriting my book. And my daughter, who was 20 then, now she's about to be 21. My daughter, Zazie, who's also in the book. Mm -hmm. She's very winning. Thank you. Thank you. She is. And um, maybe she'll come out. I don't know. She's like a like a mythical animal, like who lives in, a <laughs> in her bedroom. Like she might come out, she might not. It's like the t like you know. Did you ever hear about the tadger when you were at camp? Did they tell you the tadger tales? The tadger was this mythical creature, and you would see. We had like a version. Yeah. Okay, she's like the tadger. So mm -hmm. um, I I don't even know if she's here. So she had been living at college, and she came home to live with me. So we have been mm -hmm. together every single day for 380 something days, whatever it's been. And it's been great. Wow. I mean, I, I mean, thank God we are lucky. We didn't get sick. Thank God. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel so lucky that, that I could just, you know, be okay and sit here and work. And I mean, there were some financial kind of scares like everybody. Because everything started to change, and it's already been changing with our industry, with books and journalism and publishing. It's gotten, you know, very gig economy esque, and uh, having a book come out a year later than you thought it was going to come out created some, you know, questions for me. Like, was I going to have to sell this apartment? I mean, look at it. I don't want to sell this apartment. <laughs> for, it's not very big, but it's homey, and it's my home, and I've been here for twenty years, and. But I, but I write it, everything, things worked out. So that was my, how was your, how was your quarantine? What did you do? Um, I didn't do a lot. <laughs> I, um, I spent a lot of time alone and, <laughs> and was um, interested in the people that were dating, um, but was not in a place to date myself. I ventured back into the, you know, online dating, whatever in January oh, I didn't go on dates. And, and realized I was sort of too depressed and didn't have enough talk about to date. But that brings me to something, you know, now that sort of the world is opening up a bit again. And a friend of mine um, said something to me that I have standards that are too high. And you write in the book that your friend says that you date men beneath you. And I guess I'm just wondering, um, is that is that a good thing? And do you think, think the sort of I do you think, think men think, get these same kind of I think you know admonish are sexist? What I mean, what is too good for you and what is too bad for you? Like I, I mean I think that's a sex sexist thing mm -hmm. that kind of suggests that a woman is to be rated as a, a commodity whose value is is a, is a set price mm -hmm. whereby um, a man is is the val is the is the barometer of what her value is and I reject that I don't think that you can what I say to the person who says that to me who happens yeah, to what be, do you say? well what I say to the person who says that to me and she's a friend of mine you know we all have friends like this who I think are I was trying to tell you what's wrong with you. I think, that, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, because it makes them feel better and um, about themselves. And uh, I think, I don't know, but she, you know, she's my friend. I still love her, but she, she's always telling me what's wrong with me. And that's one of the things she tells me that's wrong with me is that I date men who are beneath me, but I wasn't raised that way to think that anybody's beneath anybody or that anybody is above anybody. I mean, okay. we're human beings looking for connection. That's why dating apps and dating companies are so uh, so able to exploit us because we're mm -hmm. all vulnerable when it comes to dating. We all need we all need connection. We all need someone, and in our lives or not. I mean, of course, there are people. We we in this time that we're living, I think we're becoming so much more aware that there's no one way to be, and there's no one way that's right or wrong. So yes, of course, mm -hmm. there are people who don't want to be with anybody and they want to be alone. And that's cool too. But I think that what dating apps do is they tap into and exploit that human need for connection. And um, I don't really think that anybody's beneath me or above me. Mm -hmm. All equal, right? But I guess there's this sort of, 
sex in the city, Mr. Big idea that goes back, you know, way before <laughs> that show came out. But, you know, this sort of idea of women, you know, pursuing the kind of big fish, big catch, you know, and I guess it goes back to the idea that women's primary assets are, you know, their looks, their bodies, uh, and that what men bring to the table is a certain amount of power or something like that. And I think what's interesting is how much of a wholesale rejection of that your book is. Oh, yeah. I mean, didn't I just hear in your intro that you grew up like with hippies? Because I did, too. I grew yeah. up, I grew up, um, you know, I talk about this in the book. This is related to the book, actually, because when you talk about yourself as your romantic self or a person who dates, you suddenly realize that everything goes back to your parents, but not only back to your parents. Now, I would reject also the idea that it's all your parents and everything about you is programmed by your parents. <laughs> and there's studies that say that siblings have and, and peers have as much or more of an effect on your personality and your values than your parents. But your parents are pretty important. So when I did this sort of investigative memoir into the online dating industry, I was also doing an investigation into myself and what, why I made the choices that I did. And choice is a big word in this book. Okay. I am really concerned about the way that choice is undermined. I think dating app people love the word disrupted, but I would say undermined by technology. I mean, what is choice on a dating app that is feeding you people to meet through algorithms that are biased, um, in so many ways, biased about looks, biased about how many matches you get, biased about race, terrible racism on dating apps. I, I cite all kinds of studies. There's a, a 2018 Cornell study about racism and the algorithms of dating apps. So what is choice when we are being essentially programmed? And that's not some kind of like X-Files conspiracy theory. This is what the business model is, is to program you. This is what the engineering of these things do. And you know, Sean Parker, the former president of Facebook, talked about it very proudly in a in an interview in 2017. Like, yeah, of course, it's social condition social conditioning. It's called the validation feedback loop. We give you dopamine hits, so you'll basically use our products and do what we want. Look at the ads we want you to. So this mm -hmm. is all true of dating apps too, but nobody ever talks about that because I think that there's this romantic notion that no one wants to let go of that these that there's a fairy godmother and it's a dating app called Bumble or Tinder or whatever. And it's a fairy godmother mm -hmm. that's going to come along and, you know, match us with, with the man or woman or a person who identifies in other ways of our dreams. And, and we're all going to ride off into the sunset together. Now I'm not saying I would never say that there aren't people who haven't found love on these apps. Of course I know there are, but for the main, for the majority of people, that's not what's happening for the majority. And this is statistically borne out too. for the main of people who use these things. What's happening is that they are engaging with the app more than anything or anyone. And mm -hmm. they're engaging with the app. They're giving our time, our money and our data to this mm -hmm. business. It's a business that wants to make mm -hmm. money off of us. Which is not so different from the way that we engage in any other social media. You know, we are in, we are the products of Instagram. Yeah, you know? yeah, like exactly. They We're feed just, us this game so that they can feast on our information, right? Right, and our data. But I, whereas I think people, you know, everybody's watched The Social Dilemma now, and please watch my film, Swipe, hooking up with the digital mm -hmm. you'll see, which came out two years before. It's very similar in terms of talking about addiction. Um, mm -hmm. I think that people, whereas they can accept that and, and, and are finally starting to confront that we're in what's called tech clash now, where mm -hmm. we're looking at Google and Facebook and Apple and Amazon and saying, wait a minute, you guys are destroying this civilization. But for some reason, this same set of, of, uh, of realizations doesn't filter into how they look at online dating, but it's exactly the same. So getting back to choice. So dating apps are making you choose certain things and your parents, okay. Your parents set up this model too, for what you are going to either embrace or reject. And I started looking at my parents and the models that they gave me. And I mm -hmm. love my parents very, very much, but they were both 
I, I love my mo my mother's still alive. My father passed away, but mm -hmm. I love them very much. But they were both products of their time, and my mother and my father both, um, you know, were responsible, you know, unwittingly a lot, I think, for conditioning me in certain ways that mm -hmm. I've only really lately conditioned me in certain ways as a woman that mm -hmm. have only really that have been very very hard to deal with, and they got fed all that by their time and their culture but how are you working against know. that with with your daughter like how are you sort of you know fighting that um desire to condition her and what kind of information I are you not giving to her? Condition her i desire not to condition her like i'm aware of it mm -hmm. and i desire not to do that and i and uh, talk to her mm -hmm. from the time she's little very little as you know in age-appropriate ways about feminism about feminist mm -hmm. themes, you know, whether it was when we're sitting right here in the morning and, uh, you know, I'm like making her food or, 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 or having breakfast with her. And uh, we're like, we used to watch I Love Lucy in the morning because on the Hallmark Aww. Channel, Lucy at 5 a.m. And Lucy is a very good show to watch in terms with little girls, I found, in terms of talking about feminism because it's both feminist and not. And then there would be the ads on the Hallmark Channel for like the cleaning products. And they would have <laughs> women fighting over who had a cleaner toilet. And this is like in 2005, you know, you think we're all, and I, so when they're that little, you don't say like, let's talk about Andrea Dworkin. What you say, well, what I said is um, like, what would Andrea Dworkin say about this toilet commercial? That's not what I would do. I would say more like, mm -hmm those ladies are fighting over a toilet. That's crazy. You're and really she, ruining and my Andrea Dworkin for children. Right. And then she would, say, and and she would say like, yeah, who cares about the toilet? And I'd be like, yeah, you know, like that kind of thing. So you make it funny and light. And, mm -hmm. and then now we do sit on the couch and talk about Andrea Dworkin. Like and we do. But bringing it back to dating, how are you making her an educated consumer with with you know hookup culture which you've certainly written about on college campuses with apps with you know all of these sort of uh nouveau ways that we that we find each other these days well i never gave her a phone a cell phone because 2012 when she was around 12 years old was when mm -hmm. girls in her school started getting cell phones and um you know, now it's younger. Now it's like the average age I think is eight or 10, but it was like mm -hmm. it was around 12 then. And the girls were getting cell phones and it seemed like the thing everybody was doing, but I had a revolution of consciousness about social media right around that time because of the death of Amanda Todd. Amanda Todd was a Canadian girl who um, killed herself and she did her suicide note online on YouTube and uh -huh. I saw the stories about because a man an older man had convinced her to take off her shirt he screenshotted her naked image and shared it non-consensually shared nude this was my first real you know learning about this and mm -hmm. it devastated me and one of the reasons why it did was because I realized actually when I was writing this book even more because I do go into my own history and everything and how what made me me and what made me act the way that I do with men and one mm -hmm. of the things that I thought about with Amanda Todd was that could have been me I mean I was so sexualized as a young person <laughs> I was given all of this not really from my parents so much but from media from television from loves baby soft lip gloss, you know, mm -hmm. and, right. And ditto jeans and Brooke Shields, who's a wonderful person. And I, I've interviewed her and I love her, but you know, nothing comes between, she didn't make the ad. Nothing comes between me yeah. and the when she was 14. So we all thought we had to be real sexy and there were guys, older guys hitting on us right away. And it was very confusing. And I was raped as a 14 year old. And my first experience mm -hmm. of sexual intercourse, which is not, Atypical, I found out when I was doing this mm. research, researching that a lot of girls 
around the world, not just in America, their first experience of intercourse is rape. And I didn't even know it was right at the time. I didn't, you'll read about in the book if you read the book, but I, 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 like the circumstances were such that like, I didn't even know to call it that, you mm -hmm. know? And it was only much- Yeah, it's very, it's very powerful the way that you write about it. I, I mean, this is sort of the opposite side of the coin, but another thing that I noticed that was very deft was the way that you write about sex in general, including pleasurable sex and like, that is something that a lot of writers do very poorly. And, um, well, and I'm wondering, you. <laughs> you know, how, how do you write good sex? And um, oh, is it, you. is it just being plain and descriptive? Is it focusing on details? You know, I'm not necessarily looking at it in a sort of writing workshop way, but it's something that you do so vividly and in such a different way from most writers. And I um, would say that. Um, I, I don't know. You know, it's like saying, well, how do you have red hair? Like, I, I don't know. I think it's <laughs> I'm very, I, I mean, it's, it's hard to like talk about sex these days with a, you know, there's a great song salt and pepper did back in the, in the eighties, I think or early nineties, that was one of my, I love, I love early, I love all hip hop, but I especially love early hip hop. Let's talk about sex, baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, let's talk about you. You and me. Right, exactly. Oh, oh, I wonder if the, the rights people are, don't bother novel neighbor, neighbor about me singing a few bars of that song. It was less than 15 seconds okay. or whatever the copyright okay. well, is. So that was my upbringing too. There was like, there's all kinds of influences that go on, right? There's good, right. there's bad, there's like, you're, you know, sex is good, sex is bad, you know, all these things. But, um, so I don't want to like be uh, inappropriate. So if you feel at any time I'm being inappropriate when I say these things, just tell me and I'll stop. But I like sex. You know, and I and I always yeah. shut it down. Let's get out of here. <laughs> My daughter gave me this fan. Inappropriate. No, let's you've been go. watching. Yeah. Oh, it's getting hot in here. <gasps> you've, been, you've been watching. Have you watched Contra ContraPoints? She's my no. she's my favorite new person. Okay. ContraPoints is a, a trans YouTuber, and she's brilliant. Well, no, her name is really Natalie Wynn, but she has a YouTube channel called ContraPoints and she's just watch it. She's brilliant. And okay. she also she has lots of fans. And oh, she, love and all so the fans. My I was nervous about doing this. And so my daughter brought me this fan. She said, if you get nervous, just do like ContraPoints. You know, a diva move. So it's also pretty hot in New York, which it adds it's to like it. But. Five degrees in this house. I have a fan on. So okay. So um what was I gonna say? Sex scenes. I like to have sex and and Ain't nothing wrong with that. Um, I haven't always liked the men attached to the penises that I have sex with, especially mm -hmm. not after I get to know them. But I, you know, all of my relationships have ended in complete disaster. And I always blame myself. You know, everyone's like, well, what are you doing wrong? Do you think that's and, fair? No, of course not. We live in systemic misogyny. Finally, we've all like agreed upon some, I mean, I'm not saying I'm blameless, but it's so often put upon the woman because we are judged on the success of our relationships, you know? Mm -hmm. And do you have a boy? From the time you're little, people ask you, do you have a boyfriend? When my daughter was very, very little, mm -hmm. very little, people would say to her, do you have a boyfriend? And I used to be so mad and say like, don't say that to her. How do you even know if she likes boys? Like mm -hmm. that is just so invasive and, and don't condition her in exactly that way that I do not want to be doing myself. Do not do that. And sometimes mm -hmm. I would, I'd tell them, not in front of her, but so what am I trying to say? Write it about sex. Oh, so I decided when I did this piece, this book, I'm saying mm -hmm. piece because I'm a journalist. Like I can't get away from it. When I decided to write my book, I decided I was going to be honest because nothing works in a memoir if you're not honest. I you can mm -hmm. smell the you can smell the lies. I like agree. Daddy yeah. said in Cat on Hot Roof, I smell mendacity. I would always be smelling that in certain memoirs. I don't want to say their names. But um, there's memoirs that I really, really love. And I, I say, I met, read so many before I wrote this. And I said, what do I love about this memoir? It's honest. And so that's what I wanted to do. So sex, whether it was good or bad or, you know, felt 
fantastic or didn't feel fantastic because I think a lot of women can relate to those moments when we're having sex that we actually did consent to. It's not like it's rape, but it it's just not great. And it's sort of like, I have a young friend of mine. Um, again, I don't want to, I don't want to offend anybody, but like, you know, if you read the book, you'll see that like, there's a lot of very graphic talk because that is what, that's what, that's how you get to the real is. And she said, um, you know, sometimes I just go through with it just to get it over with. You know, yeah. and there's a scene. In well, the that act, that's something that I think about a lot. I've certainly done that. And I think of it, I associate it with sort of 2014 when Tinder was just on the rise. And you write about using Tinder in the sort of earlier days, the first kind of boom in 2014. And I was also... Uh, going through sort of like a Tinder moment in that well, phase. We it was really are. novel, well, but we I kind of like, went yeah. off and never went back. And so I guess I'm wondering yeah. if you can give people who are, you know, watching and maybe aren't in the online dating trenches, like what is the difference between Tinder or just apps and uh, dating apps as a loose term now versus maybe they were in like the late nineties when they come out and in 2014, you know, when Tinder was on the rise. Well, the first thing you should know is that if we're talking about people who are not on dating apps, we're talking about people who are not dating because it's mm -hmm. again, I mean, I don't mean to repeat myself, but it's really overwhelmed dating. So if we're talking to people who are not dating, they're either married or don't wish to be dating. Mm -hmm. So anybody who dates, I don't know, or there are people <laughs> like me who just have hold out the naive hope that they will meet someone. I don't know at a restaurant no, or something. No, I, like don't, I'm not, I don't think it's naive hope. I I hope it's true. I'm I'm talking mm -hmm. about it. My book is really a corporate critique, as you know. It's really a critique mm -hmm. of. Which is why it's so effective. You're not laying the blame on people who no, are using dating victims. apps or dating. We're victims of this crap. We're getting mm -hmm. this, really. We, they don't even really know what it's going to do to us. And again, I don't mean to sound like Fox Mulder or something, but like they, 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 we, we, we've only just begun with this and we don't really know what the repercussions of it are going to be. And I think it's dangerous in so many ways, physically, emotionally, all kinds mm -hmm. of things. But mm -hmm. so here's what it was. Here's what it was. And if you weren't doing it back then, um, Grinder came out in, two, in 2009, right? Uh -huh. And I was hearing from all my gay friends about Grinder, and I quote gay men in the book who say that straight people mm -hmm. would judge them for what they were doing on Grinder, which was basically hooking up. The Grinder, Grinder, um, Grinder didn't have the swipe. Tinder invented the swipe. But Grinder had geolocation for like where somebody was. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they were very close by, and you know you could just hook up with them. And and gay men, especially my gay men friends, would tell me that. And gay men that I've interviewed tell me that like they didn't really talk about it a lot with straight people a lot of the time because mm -hmm. it was so judged. Well, that was so hypocritical because actually straight people had been doing the same thing with Match and whatever back from the nineties. You know, I went on Match in the early 2000s when I first became a single mom. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I I guess I'm going to have to do this thing that's, like, just for, like, old people. I was only, like, 35 at the time. But I can't leave this house because I have to be with this child. So if I'm going to talk to a mm -hmm. man, I have to go on Match. It was just for old people back then. Mobile mm -hmm. dating later came and changed all that and made it hip and cool with, you know, first it was OK Cupid was cool and then Tinder and was perceived to be cool. I don't think it was actually cool at all, but... I think there's nothing cool about online dating. Nothing, nothing. I don't think like following in you know lockstep with what a capitalist you know wants you to do is cool. Not at all. But mm -hmm. um, how has it changed? Then, well, so so you know in the past decade or so. Well, straights were st so. What I'm trying to say is that straights were hooking up. Men men were already even in early 2000s. There was a lot more like pretending to get to know you. There was a lot more emails sent back and forth, like mm -hmm. pretending you're doing some kind of you got mail thing. But when push came to shove, it was push coming to shove and guys still wanted to hook up. They just weren't, it wasn't part of the discourse of heterosexual culture. And it wasn't like in movies or anything, but it was totally happening. 
you know? Mm -hmm. So it was pretty hypocritical that they had this view of Grindr because when Tinder went mobile, Tinder came out in 2000, end of 2012, early 2013, that revolutionized everything, especially because of the swipe. That's why I felt called my film Swiped because we are all being swiped mm. by, this, by this company. It's The swipe is a really diabolical addiction machine that was mm -hmm. invented by a guy named Jonathan Bedeen, who uh, was one of the co-founders of Tinder. And he, I interviewed him in my film Swiped with, that came out in 2018. You can still see it on HBO and Amazon Prime. I don't get any money for that. But anyway, it... Swiping and every dating app does not have swiping. That is true, but a lot immediately adopted it because it's so immediately addictive. Mm -hmm. like I've had people who don't really use this stuff and have interviewed me for this book, and they'll be like, "Nancy Joe, how did you get addicted?" Um, because that's the design, that's the business mm -hmm. model, and it's almost instant. I've had people just watch my film and want to swipe, and I didn't really think that was going to happen because we have these mm -hmm. graphics, these, I think really cool graphics in the film, in the documentary that I made swiped of swiping of images of people. And I've had people watch it, the film, and then be like, you know, I went home, like watch it with me in this living room and then say like, I went on Tinder last night just from watching the film. I think that there's something so, and then watching like the match screens, it's that dopamine hit. There's something so addictive and mesmerizing about it. And I, I uh, object to it because it's very tight. And, you know, men always say, well, men get swiped on too. It's true. But if you know anything about sexism and misogyny, you know mm -hmm. what the male gaze is. And you know how all of this plays into the male gaze. And it's very much a hot or not, are you fuckable or not fuckable kind of game where women are rated. And the thing that's really dangerous about it is that if you're a guy who's like not particularly sexist, if you use that, you become more sexist mm. because you're you're agreeing to it. You're agreeing. The behavior creates attitudes. This is like a principle of um, like tech design that the behavior behaviors encourage attitudes. And is that why you call it the Inferno? I mean, it's in the subtitle and you literally quote Dante's Inferno at some point in the book. <laughs> well, I, I was rereading re Dante actually. Mm -hmm. Oh, casual, casually rereading Dante as one does, oh, it's good for you. <laughs> um, I read a lot of books. My, my dad, my wonderful dad, who uh, started out like pretty problematic but grew and changed and evolved and became my best friend. One of the really great things that he did for me was always make me read and give me books. So you see, I got a lot of books. And uh, yeah, I was rereading Dante and I was so amazed at how in the very beginning of the Inferno, it describes exactly what it felt like to be going into this wilderness of online dating. It felt like getting lost. It felt like getting mm -hmm. lost. And I was in, in, in Dante in, in, in the poem, he's in midlife. I, mm -hmm. I'm bad at quoting things. I, can you do that? I can never remember exact words of quotes, even though I've read all these. Never. Books. No. I, I, the person, I have a friend, my friend Andreas from Chile. He'll be like, I'm so sad, so I'm so. And, that's a, and he'll just go on and on. And I'm like, how do you know that? It's not even your main language. He speaks Spanish and then English. So, but I can't quote. But anyway, he says something like, in the middle of life, I lost my way. This is mm -hmm. a very bad paraphrase of Dante. In, in the middle of life, I lost my way and wandered into the wilderness. And that is exactly what happened. I wandered into the wilderness and there were all kinds of, <laughs> there were all kinds of circles of hell. The circles of hell were named in the book. They're named the choking boy and the pie boy and the boy from Queens, and the clueless boy who didn't know what a clitoris was, never heard that word. And there was, um, there were lots of boys. I had a, sometimes I would sit right here with them, have a drink, talk, whatever, and try and get to know them. And then after they left, I would, I would write down things that they said in this notebook that I had written on the cover, boys. 
you know, because they were not men, they were boys. Sure. I mean, developmentally speaking. And I, um, I felt. And um, I didn't really plan on writing about them. In fact, some of them who knew I was a writer, they'd say, are you going to write about me? And I'd say, no, of course not. And I didn't, and I, I was honest in that. I didn't really mean to, mean to, but it was just so fascinating and became more, it was, it was a change. It was, I really feel like this book that I wrote charts a, a, a an historic change in that I lived through. Mm -hmm. Like, like John, like Justin Garcia is a guy that I interviewed. He's a research scientist at Kinsey Institute of Sex, you know, the big sex institute. Mm -hmm. He's the research director, actually, and I interviewed him for this book and for my film. And he said, he was the first person I said to me, we are going through the biggest change in mating, what what scientists call mating, since the agricultural revolution. Wow. You know, it's heavy. And I felt like I'm living through something momentous in a way that no one's really, really acknowledging or confronting or talking about or seeing how it's affecting them. Mm -hmm. or, talk, or writing about how it's affecting them. We have about 20 minutes left, and I think it would be nice to open up and, and see if we have any questions oh, yes. from I would love uh, the audience. And I think while people are um, asking, let's see. So someone asked, do you think there is any way to salvage online dating? You know, I often get, often, I mean often, get an email or a, um, a you know, a DM or something, mm -hmm. somebody who says, I am so-and-so and I'm starting a dating app. Mm -hmm. I yeah, I get some help. of those pitches, yeah. Yeah, well, I want you to help me because I want it to be good and I want, and they're, they're very sincere, you know? I want it to be good and I want it to help people find true love and, I, you know, I believe that they're sincere and I, and I, I wish I could help them all, I, though I don't usually do that kind of work consulting, but, I wish I could help them, but I always think to, to a couple of things that are, are really a problem. And well, several things are a problem. Number one, there's a the problem of engagement. They're going to have to at some point get investors and their investors are going to want to make money and they're going to want to make money. And the way that they make money, the business model, unfortunately, as it currently exists, seems to be engagement. And I've talked to people who work at Google, recently and can you for people who might not know can you tell us what engagement means just use like you want people to use it more and more and more and more and more and how do you get them to you you want them to use it in a dating situation this is a a conflict of interest because if you really wanted people to be successful at using your app there would be a point at which they wouldn't use it anymore and that's not the business model that currently exists so that they can make money, which is you want people to use it more and more and more and more. And there are other really big problems. Another really big problem is not everybody is a good person, you know, and there is not enough vetting on these apps. They don't do it because it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. So you've had articles in places like ProPublica that tell us that there are literally sexual predators on these apps and people who are rapists and a lot of people get mm -hmm. raped and sexually assaulted. I did. I wasn't raped on a dating app date, but I was sexually assaulted twice. Mm -hmm. um, I don't need to go into what happened. You can read it in the book. I don't want to, you know, offend anybody on this platform, but, um, and I don't think it's just that there are bad people necessarily coming to it. It's like the, the UK uh, National Crime Agency did a big study and they believe that online dating actually prompts sexual violence because it gives straight men this idea that they're going to get sex mm -hmm. from this. They used to be called hookup apps. There's also just the objectification of, and, uh, you know, the remove of a screen. There's also the fact that you cannot plan for chemistry. You just can't. Mm -hmm. The thing that happens, I haven't felt that feeling in a really long time, and I don't think it's just because I'm old. And you know what I'm talking about. Back in the days when 
you would just like, you could hardly stand to be in the same room with somebody because you know, I gotta get my fan. <laughs> well, the next question, <laughs> there are two that are kind of related, which you is. Can't, you can't, you can't make that happen over an app. You never know if it's going to happen. And I've had long, long, long threads with people where it's like, wow, this person is amazing. And then you meet them and it's not like they're going to rape you or anything. It's just like, there's right. We're not even going to kiss. It's not you know? there. So in that respect, uh, someone is asking, and these are sort of two parts of a similar question, which is what were your biggest fears in writing the book? And also any recommendations for someone working on their own memoir, especially when it comes to being vulnerable without knowing how people will respond. And I feel I was, like those are, those are two pretty linked ideas. I was so afraid when I started writing this book, I was so mm -hmm. afraid. I don't, I mean, I'm, I've been through a lot of stuff. I'm a single mom. I'm pretty tough. I'm tough broad. I'm like an old tank, you know, like I can get through a lot of stuff. But when I started writing this book, I was so afraid. I, I didn't know if I could do it. I, I'd never done it before. I wasn't really, I wasn't like writing about yourself. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with the articles. Well, you, you might be from working at similar places, but for listeners, you know, viewers, I, I've always been like this big observer, like in my work, like I'm way back here, like mm -hmm. almost like a drone. Like I don't mm -hmm. get involved. I don't, you know, I'm just like a, like a big observer. I don't really know why that is. Cause when I'm in the moment with people, I get, I get very connected to what they're saying. I'm really into them as people and I talk and everything and I share things about myself. But then when I sit down to write, it's like this thing happens where I'm just like an, like I'm just observing you can't do that when you do a memoir. You have to turn that part of yourself on yourself. And it's super scary because I have this mm -hmm. person inside of me who's like, like, sees <laughs> and now suddenly I'm seeing myself. And it was like super scary. So I got very scared, but I just, I went, I got an Airbnb, like in the upstate New York. My daughter is Ozzy. She went to college. And I was like, I'm going to do like other writers do. And I went there and it was like, it was like a shack and it had mice. Mm -hmm. And I was like there in the middle of the woods and it was like Trump country. And like, I went in to the bar in the town, they had Fox news on there talking about immigration. I was like, Oh my God, I gotta get out of here. Like the whole experience of starting this book was so terrifying. Mm -hmm. But I finally had a breakthrough mm -hmm. when I started writing about sex because, Interesting. because I, because that was something that I just couldn't lie about, you know, and mm -hmm. it wasn't a scene of good sex. It was a scene of bad sex. And I mm. thought to myself, okay, this is what this is about. This is you not lying. This is you not pretending like you might've in that moment when you faked an orgasm, this is you not pretending, but I'm not the only one who fakes sometimes. I mean, sometimes I don't fake. Sometimes I, don't. I would prefer not to, but sometimes you fake just because like, you want the guy to feel bad about the fact that you're not having, I'm like, I'm not making no orgasms in this book. And I just started like, I'm just, yeah. So I don't know. That's probably. So is that, answer. well, someone also asked what your biggest triumph was in writing the book. And, and is that it? Was it that moment where it became easier for you or you got over your own trepidations and fear and pushed through into writing about bad sex? I don't really feel so much triumph, you know, mm. because like, look at my bookshelves. Look who I read. I read. I ain't ever going to We can't see that close. Yeah. I ain't ever going to be most of the people on these shelves. I like, I do okay. But I real, you know, I've just finished reading Beloved for the third time. Mm. And you can't feel too triumphant when she did that. But I do the best I can. Yeah, but not all of us have had Sofia Coppola make a movie out of our, our work, which is also another question, which is sort of the biggest shift for you between short form and long form journalism writing. And I would also add to that and with the, you know, film and TV and documentary work that, that you've been doing. Well, I started doing the documentary. The book is a lot about how I became a filmmaker, too. In, it is, yeah. in middle age, in menopause, going through, you know, 
you talk about being a hippie, you think like, right, I'm a hippie. I'm going to be fine with getting old. Sure. I'm going to like, I'll be cool with it. Uh, no, <laughs> I was not cool with it at all. I was like, what the hell is happening to me? And, and it was just awful. And it was really hard for me. And, and I denied it for a really long time. And I hated that, that women don't have more support and more people to talk to about it and, and not in a self deprecating way, which I think I do some in the book, but it, it was like, I gained weight. I got acne. I got white hair. I, you know, I had to wear readers. I, I'm like Mr. Magoo. I can't go anywhere without these things now, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. right. I'm fine with it now. I am fine with it now. I'm just like, I'm, I'm great because I'm out the other side. I'm out of the inferno. But when I was in that inferno of like dealing with menopause and not with any social support of anyone like saying it's going to be okay, you're okay, you know, um, not even knowing what it was or what to expect. Um, and I was interviewing a lot of teenage girls for my book, American Girls, Social Media and the Secret Lives of Teenagers, who are going through intense trauma. I would go, like, because of social media, cyberbullying, mm -hmm. I would go back to my hotel room and, like, cry. Mm -hmm. These stories of non-consensually shared nudes, terrible, ter like, it was like, there should be some kind of, like, new Bible or something. I don't mean to get all religious written for like the bad things that we do to each other now the kids do to each other and especially due to girls and i was just like so and how we should not do them and i was so upset on so many levels and i started acting out and like yelling at people and like being like Wah! you know like these cops tried to arrest me in louisville kentucky and i, was, I just like yelled at them until they didn't arrest me I'm not saying that's a good thing. That's not a good thing. But there's you know, another good question. I felt this dragon coming up out of me. <laughs> what? Like, I call her the Drogon. It was like, you know, in, in the Game of Thrones when Daenerys like jumps on the Drogon like, mm -hmm. and, and like flies around and like destroys the city. That's how I started to feel sometimes, especially if anyone would say anything sexist, especially to me or to someone I knew or loved. Like, my, I was walking along with my daughter. And this guy, Kat, called her from a car. It was mm -hmm. summertime, so his window was open. We were coming back from, you know, with the mm -hmm. food. And this is when I was in the throes of menopause. And he, like, said something to her. And she was maybe 15. And I just hopped on Drogon. And I went over to that car. And I'm not, I'm not trying to – I'm not saying this as, like, oh, aren't I cool story. I'm just describing to you what menopause was like for me. I took my spaghetti and meatballs, what was left of it, and I just like, boop, like put it on his oh, head. Wow. Like, like, have a good evening. Well, I want to give us time to answer this this question, which is a good one, which is what opportunity, if we can call it that, does coming out of quarantine present to initiate some of these changes, given that for a while it felt like we didn't have any options outside of online dating? I, you know, I'm, I'm, I want people who read my book to know you're not alone. Cause I know that so many people have gone through the things I've gone through. Cause I've interviewed hundreds of people, women, especially, and, and all kinds of people. And I've read all these studies and everything. And I know this isn't making us happy and it's not making us feel good. And it's not getting us the kind of connections we want or relationships we want. I think we have to change if we're, if we're talking about straight men, I think straight men have to change. They have to change. They have to become mm -hmm. aware. Oh, look. Who's oh. Uh, yeah. Oh, look. Hi. 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 Tadger, Tadger. <laughs> just saying, this is Marissa. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And, the, and this is the uh, world watching your mom talk about her book. This is Zazie, my daughter. How was it for you to be written about? in the um, book and have you read it yeah i've read it um it was it was fine yeah um <laughs> i mean you know she talks to me about it before she did it so yeah like when you say like how do you talk like how do you raise her to 
know about dating. Well, she, I talked to her about all my interviews and everything. And Zazie was actually an assistant producer on Swipes, which we made on this dining room table. And uh, you've been hearing about what is it like, Zazie, growing up in a household with a mother who talks about all this? Um, <laughs> I think it's useful. I think it's useful. Mm -hmm. um, Good. Yeah, it's all of the you know cautionary tales that are helpful in going out into the world. So. Well, going out into the world is an exciting thing. So are you going out into the world, Nancy Dro? Are you dating anyone right now? Are you online? No, I do go out in the world. I go out in the world. That's I, good. Yeah. She does. I go out and I see my friends. I wander around my neighborhood. I live in the East Village, which is a wonderful neighborhood in New York City. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of community still in this neighborhood. And um, I... Uh, I try and get her to come out with me, but she won't always come. And I, uh, I walk around. I talk to my friends. I don't feel a lot of pressure to date right now. I mean, also, I don't want to get coronavirus. Like, I, <laughs> you know, like I have been. I mean, they say there's coronavirus, like in men's semen. So, I don't want that to happen to me. And I just, um, sorry, I just, I. Uh, I mean, they, I mean, I'm sure I embarrass her like way more than I should. Do I embarrass you? No. Okay. So I just, you know, like I need a breather. Mm -hmm. And I, don't, I also don't want to online date anymore because I don't think it works. I think, oh, okay, bye. Say bye. 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 Thank you for the cameo. See you. Cameo. Nice to meet you too. I don't think that online dating works. I think it's uh, bad for you. Bad for me. And I don't want to do it. And so I, I don't. So is the alternative just not to date? Is it just to be really, you know, putting yourself out there to use a phrase that my mother is fond of? What is, well, I would like to what should we be doing? At some point. But I, I think I'm just going to have to go about it differently. I don't mm -hmm. know what to do. Dating is broken. This is what I hear from so many people, especially young women. Dating is broken. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we need to free ourselves from these platforms. I really do think mm -hmm. it's burdensome. I think it's a form of, you know, um, it's labor. We're laboring for companies when we online date. We don't realize mm -hmm. it because it seems like a thing that should be fun. And yet the word I use, the word I hear so often is exhausting. It feels exhausting. That's because it's labor. You're actually laboring for people. Sometimes actually paying people to, so you can labor for them. You're giving mm -hmm. them data. And I don't want to be somebody's device wife, which is what mm -hmm. uh, my friend, Abigail, young woman in the book calls it constantly being on demand for some guy to like sort of have you there in the background, just feeling like somebody acknowledges his existence. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but I believe we can do it. I believe that we can reconnect on our own in new, creative, dynamic, interesting, fun ways that do not serve the man. That's such a nice note to end it on. I think, well, that's, a, I think that's a positive mm -hmm. note. That is. And on that note, literally as I was joining, I saw this comment come through and I just want to like see if there's anything that we can answer quickly with this. Someone just said, we're exhausting ourselves talking to girls and each other around these topics. Do you find anyone is writing specifically to boys and men about what you were just saying? I mean, my book, American Girls, I was trying to raise awareness about things that had not been talked about. Mm -hmm. before that, which was the ways that social media was uh, oppressing girls through sexualization and cyberbullying, all these things we've just discussed. So I, I, um, you know, I was trying to raise awareness about their experience and what was happening to them. And I'm trying to do that with swiped and I'm trying to do that with this book as well. So I don't, I mean, part of feminism is consciousness raising, being aware of what's happening and, and being honest about and, and acknowledging people's experiences, there's there's not enough acknowledgement of really what online dating is like for, for most people, especially women, people of color, people in the LGBT communities who tend to be more challenged by all of this. 
And um, so I don't, I don't, I, I don't feel bad about talking about that. You know, if men, men, like I said before, straight men, really not every single man, there's good men out there. Okay. Don't, don't at me. But I mean, you know, if you're a man with a raised consciousness, the man who I dedicated this book to who comes from St. Louis, Missouri was the biggest feminist I've ever known and taught me a lot about feminism. Donald Suggs Jr., gay rights activist, look him up. Amazing St. Louis, Missouri man. So I, I think men do need to change, though, overall. We, we all need to change systemic misogyny and the ways that we, um, I mean, the book is also about the ways that I, I included, believe me, I'm not pointing the finger at anyone, have been complicit, you know. I picked up a lot of guys' underwear, you know, and, like, you know what I'm talking about, all the things you do to, like, serve men that I learned from my mother. I mean, I've done all those things. So I, I, um, I don't know is the question like what writers will tell men how to behave better? Just uh, if anyone is doing that or if that's like the next. Andrea Dworkin, Audre Lorde, um, you know, any feminism, feminist writers, Toni Morrison. Yeah. But what about ones that are still alive? Well, Nancy Jo Sales. Okay, and, uh, all right. There's like, there's so many. I mean, Rebecca Solnit is like one of my heroes. She's just amazing, you know. Well, and maybe that's like the note to end on is that your book really is for everyone. Like there's a part of it that for women might be affirming in reading this and to realize, you know, I think you said this earlier that you're not alone, <laughs> that you're not the only one having these experiences and it's something we need to talk about and also a like, large gigantic capitalized hint to men to also pay attention to what is being written and understand like what's being received on the other end and how because i think for some of them it would be extremely eye-opening to read your book not just some probably many 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 um i think you're i think you're so kind to say that I, honestly like when you write something i I, when I write something, I don't think to myself, I am going to change society with this. You know what I mean? Like, if if it does work towards that end, I'm so thrilled. But I just try to share my experience and the and the and the things that I know to be true from research and and experience. And I just I don't know what else I can do. I'm not. Um, you know, Hillary Clinton once said to me, <laughs> you know, name drop. Hillary Clinton once said to me, she did, I met her in the 90s at this party and, and Russell Simmons, who's now like in Fiji because he had a Me Too thing, but he, it was a party at his house, it was a fundraiser at his house for Hillary Clinton. And he introduced me to Hillary Clinton in the 90s. I was writing all these books about, uh, I'm sorry, all these articles for New York Magazine about teenagers. And she said to me, yes, you tell us the problems, but you don't tell us what to do about it. And I was like, <laughs> like, I just like dissolved into ash on the floor. Like I got so burned, like, but I was like a much younger person then. I was 30 years old and I didn't know what to do. I just knew that it was my job to go out there and find out what was going on and tell people. And, and I still kind of feel like that. I don't know that I'm like the greatest reformer of, of the world. I'm more like a storyteller and a journalist and a now a memoirist. And, and that's, that's what I have to offer. Well, it is a beautiful, wonderful, um, helpful, affirming memoir. Um, and we are just like so thankful that we got to be a part of your book's birthday and launch day. Um, and I can't wait to see how other things go. And a reminder that you're giving out baguettes and books tomorrow. Um, I Ooh, mean, Lindy Cafe in NYC. Yes. 30. Come get you back yet, but you don't get it unless you tell me your your favorite Tinder story. Oh man, wow! I could really entertain you for a while. <laughs> we'll after, huh? Well, let's talk after. Yes, so I'll tell you a great one. Um, so just a reminder to everyone tuning in, if you haven't picked up or ordered your copy yet, you definitely still have time to. And we have signed book plates from Nancy Joe herself. Um, and we also have, if you're 
in St. Louis, we have like I've been in the background enjoying this with this beautiful, delightful. Oh, it looks so good! It's that so gorgeous, so fresh and delicious. It's awesome. Um, so if you're in St. Louis, STL Barkeep hooked us up with a customized cocktail for this event that has um, uh, twelve twenty vodka and twelve twenty. Um, Flora, which is kind of like their response to Aperol, um, and then some other things like grapefruit and lemon and hibiscus in it. So you can still pick that up. Um, and if you are not in St. Louis, don't worry. We still have you covered because we have in booze cocktail kits, which will make you a batch cocktail. And there's a bunch of different um, flavor options that you have on our website. We try to make sure there's something for everyone. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Thank and you, part Stephanie. Of this. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Marissa. Congratulations. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead, Marissa. I didn't mean <laughs> No, no. Just chiming in. Today. And everybody it's read Marissa's book too, because her book is amazing. This is big. A thank great you. book. A great book. Thank um, you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to both of you. Um, I wish you could have seen my face in the background. So <laughs> goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.